Hi, and welcome to Dr. V's Chemistry Webcast. In this webcast, we're going to discuss two brief topics. We're going to compare incomplete and complete combustion and talk briefly about redox reactions. So I wanted to talk about combustion reactions in a little more depth. We talked about combustion reactions in my classes of chemical reactions webcast, that what makes them combustion reactions is having oxygen as a reactant, and we're making oxides. And I really want to emphasize that for combustion reactions, it's all about oxygen as the reactant. We spent a lot of time talking about the combustion of hydrocarbons, where we've got a hydrocarbon made out of only carbon and hydrogen, and when it burns in oxygen, we make carbon dioxide and water. Great. But we can actually go a little further into this. I also wanted to mention that combustion reactions are very exothermic and they give off a lot of heat. So the primary focus in a first year high school chemistry course is complete combustion. And that's actually what we talked about on the previous slide and in my classes of chemical reactions webcast. If you have a very ample supply of air, so there's plenty of oxygen for the reaction to occur, it's going to make carbon dioxide. So if you take octane, and combust it, it make CO2 and H2O. This is complete combustion. You need to have a lot of ventilation for complete combustion to occur. In terms of class, my high school chemistry students are expected to be able to predict products for complete combustion. So if I ask you to do a prediction problem, we're assuming complete combustion. Your teacher may have other ideas, but that's what my students are asked to do. But we can also have a situation that's referred to as incomplete combustion. If you're doing your combustion reaction in a situation where the air is not present in great excess, way more than you need, so you have a limited supply of air, instead of making carbon dioxide from your hydrocarbon, you're going to make carbon monoxide. For example, if you have propane and you combust it with an inadequate oxygen supply, instead of getting CO2, you'll make a significant amount of carbon monoxide. And carbon monoxide is a colorless, odorless, toxic gas. Combustion needs a lot of ventilation. And so part of the reason I wanted to talk about this is to remind you why you should never run your car in the garage with the garage door closed, okay? You need to keep the furnace air intakes clear of snow. We're in New England around here, and this has actually been a problem for houses in winters where we've had a lot of deep snowfall. So you do want to keep this in mind. If you're doing a combustion reaction or it's happening in your furnace or it's happening in your vehicle or you're running the grill in a situation where it doesn't have enough air coming in, you're going to get a significant buildup of carbon monoxide which can cause very serious health problems including loss of consciousness and death. Keep those air intake valves clear of snow in the winter. And because it does happen, Many, many states have made it a requirement that all residences have carbon monoxide detectors. Make sure yours is working. Update it. Check it frequently. This is not meant to be an ad for any company, but it was the best graphic I could find on the, the states with this requirement. Now, combustion reactions are ex examples of a broader categorization of reactions referred to as redox reactions. And I do want students to be able to recognize reactions as being redox. So redox reactions involve a change in charges. Different species in the reaction change their charge. And this is happening because one atom or one species is losing electrons and another atom is gaining electrons. And so we end up with a change in charges as a result. One easy way to recognize a redox reaction is if there's an element as a reaction or an element as a product, uncombined, right, not part of a compound, that's going to be a redox reaction. So that's the quick and easy way to identify redox reactions. So like I said, redox reactions involve a change in charges. Let's look at an, at an example. You know I'm going to go through an example. So if we have magnesium, and we hold it in the, in the flame and we burn it. We ignite it in the presence of oxygen. We're going to make magnesium oxide. So it's a synthesis reaction. I've got elemental magnesium reacting with elemental oxygen. Okay, so the charge of the magnesium on the reactant side is zero. It's elemental matter. It's neutral. And the oxygen is also neutral. They both have charges of zero because they're elements. But when we look at the product, the magnesium oxide, that's an ionic compound. We have magnesium ions with a charge of plus two, and we have oxide ions with a charge of minus two. So clearly things have changed. 
the magnesium went from having a charge of zero on the reactant side to plus two on the product side. The oxygen on the reactant side went from having a charge of zero to having a charge of minus two on the product side. They changed, but we also have elements as reactants. So that's an easy way to determine that this is a redox reaction. So I want to point out, since both reactants are elements, to form the compound, they had to change their charge. So we know that this is an evidence of a redox reaction. Now I want my students to be able to look at a balanced equation and decide whether it's redox or not redox. So let's look at some examples and work through them. If we have zinc reacting with sulfuric acid, I make zinc sulfate and hydrogen gas. Now I notice right away I've got zinc, elemental zinc as a reactant, I've got elemental hydrogen as a product. So yeah, this is going to be a redox reaction. But let's look at the charges. The zinc has a charge of zero. Hydrogen ions in H2SO4 have a charge of plus one. And then the sulfate just stays as sulfate, so I'm just going to kind of ignore that. And then on the product side, I have zinc ions reacting with sulfate, but the zinc now has a charge of plus two because they're ions. And the hydrogen is an element on the product side. It's got a charge of zero. So the zinc changes charge and the hydrogen changes their charge. So yeah, this is a redox reaction. But we knew that even before we looked at the different charges of the different species in the reaction. All single replacement reactions, by the way, are going to be redox reactions because it's an element with a compound to make an element with a compound. Let's look at this reaction. Sodium atoms reacting with bromine to make sodium bromide. Is this a redox reaction? Again, yes it is. Both of my reactants are elements to make a compound. They had to have changed their charge. So the sodium had a charge of zero because it's an element. The bromine has a charge of zero because it's an element. But in the ionic compound that I make on the product side, I've got sodium ions, they have a charge of plus one, and they're combined with bromide ions, and they have a charge of minus one. So yes, this too is a redox reaction. And again, we knew it before we actually looked at the charges. It's a synthesis reaction, and this synthesis reaction is a redox reaction, and many synthesis reactions are. But you can't just assume all synthesis reactions are going to be redox, because they don't always involve elements. All right, more examples. This is really helpful to figure it out. Aluminum chloride reacting to form aluminum metal and chlorine gas. Oh, this is a decomposition reaction. I've got a binary compound making two elements. Oh, but I've got elements as products. So yes, this is going to be redox as well. In the aluminum chloride, the aluminum has a charge of plus three, those ions. I've got chloride ions, three of them, each with a minus one charge. On the product side, I've got aluminum metal, which is neutral. Is an element and I've got chlorine gas which is an element and it's got a charge of zero so the aluminum change charge the chlorine change charge and yes it's a redox reaction and then I've got this reaction oh it's a double displacement reaction two ionic compounds making two ionic compounds let's look at the charges I've got potassium iodide I've got potassium ions with a charge of plus one combined with iodide ions with a charge of minus one and then I've got the lead two nitrate the lead ions have a charge of plus two I've got two nitrate ions, each at minus one, and they, you can see from looking at the equation, they just stay together, so I'm not going to do anything with those right now. On the product side, I've got lead two iodide, so the lead ions have a charge of plus two, and I've got iodide ions with a charge of minus one. And then I've got potassium ions on my potassium nitrate, combined with the nitrate, which is still nitrate, and nobody's changed their charge. So this double displacement reaction is not a redox reaction. So just to generalize, to help you think about the patterns, some decomposition reactions are redox. So if you have a binary compound decomposing to form its elements, that's redox. Other decomposition reactions, again, it depends. Double displacement reactions are not going to end up being redox. No ions are going to change charge. No elements are present in the reactions. And a little more practice, because practice is really helpful. Oh, I've got a combustion reaction. I've got CH4 reacting with oxygen. Oh, but oxygen's an element. So even without assigning any charges, and these aren't really ionic compounds, so strictly speaking, we don't have charged ions. All right, but I've got oxygen as a reactant, elemental oxygen as a reactant, and therefore this is a redox reaction. In fact, all combustion reactions are redox reactions. And then I've got well, calcium carbonate decomposing to make calcium oxide and CO2. But what I noticed looking at this reaction, I don't have any elements, elemental matter, as 
or reactant or as a product. I have a compound making two other compounds. This actually is not a redox reaction. Remember, not all decomposition reactions are redox. Some decomposition reactions are redox, but not this one. Remember, if it's a binary compound decomposing to form its elements, then it would be. But this is not an example of that. Well, I certainly hope you found this webcast to be helpful. If you did, subscribe to my channel, leave a comment on the video, and like it. The more chemistry you do, the more you will learn. Practice is the key.